Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. Now the big investment call this year was on auto stocks. Stocks like M&M and Aisha Motors have risen 30 to 50 percent in 2022. In fact, in the last fortnight, two big fund houses, ICICI Pro and IDFC, came out with thematic mutual funds on the transportation and logistics sector. So today we speak to ICICI Pro about their new NFO. Our expert is Harish Bihani, senior fund manager at ICICI Pro AMC. He's right here with me. Uh, Harish, thanks so much for joining us. But I think you know the bigger question really is uh, about the transportation and logistics sector itself right just wanted to start by asking you about that there's been massive growth potential talked about in this sector what all does this entail sure thanks Sonia uh, when you think about this particular sector you have to think about the auto OEM stocks mm -hmm. whether it's Maruti Mahindra Tata's of the world you'll have TVS motors and Bajaj autos of the world then you have to think about the auto ancillary names, again, phenomenal companies here. You have Uno Minda, you have Sundaram Fasteners, Schaffler's of the world. And then you have logistic player, whether it's the container corporation, which is the largest rail operator, the road uh, operators like a VR Logistics, even new age companies like a e-commerce delivery, or for that matter, Zomato is also included as a part of this particular theme. So you're focusing on the whole auto and logistics space, right? Transportation is your bigger theme. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll cover the entire gamut of auto, auto ancillary, logistics, and anything which is related to this particular theme. Okay, this is a very exciting space to be in, right? So let's take it to one by one. The opportunity in the auto OEM space, let's talk about that. Uh, because there is a, the wide umbrella is auto OEMs, but there's so much that comes below it. And many of these stocks have rallied already. I was talking about how M&M is up 50% this year. Sure. Uh, so where do you see the opportunity, both in terms of value and growth? Sure. So you will have to think about this entire uptick that we have seen. You have to look at it in the context of what can happen over the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. This entire spurt, this came in because things have started reviving in terms of volumes. The commodity prices have started cooling off in this particular sector. And people have started realizing that there is value in this particular sector. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, we will have to think about the context where we are in at this point in time. When you think about the last 10 years, for the passenger vehicle segment, as well as the two-wheeler segment, they have been negligible to a even marginal volume growth. Mm. And why has that happened? That has happened, let's look at the last six years, for example. Last six years, we had six major disruptions in, in India, or five major disruptions. We started with GST implementation. Then it was followed by ILFS crisis. Then we had demonetization. It was followed by the COVID-19 crisis and the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Mm. So these were the macro changes which happened in our country and fundamental changes or the global changes which led to impact on income of people. Then you had changes which happened because of regulatory reasons, which mm. were micro reasons for this particular sector. You had the change from BS4 to BS6. You had insurance cost changes. You had axle load norm changes for commercial vehicle industry. Mm. You have safety norm changes for, again, the entire industry. So what happened is that in this industry, you had either a big macro hit because income got in in certain parts, or you had a micro hit because regulatory norm changes, and then you had this entire cost increase which took place. Mm. Now we're at a point in time where things have started stabilizing. The incomes of people which got hit during COVID has started kind of gradually improving or inching up, right? Which mm. means volume will come back gradually for this particular segment. Mm. Secondly, in terms of the overall value growth which is coming in this particular segment, that should also kind of start reflecting in numbers. Third is commodity prices have started coming off, mm. right? So it's a combination of volume play, value play, because there's premiumization opportunity. We can spoke, speak more about that uh, yeah. uh, subsequently. And there's this margin improvement play, which is why uh, we are looking at this uh, theme fairly So closely. there are a lot of, like, we can see on the screen as well, right? There's passenger vehicles, there's utility vehicles, multi-purpose vehicles, uh, there are light commercial vehicles, heavy, sure. and the two-wheeler space. Now, these are very, very different brackets, right? right. Uh, two-wheelers, for example, are still struggling in the export market. Domestic market has not recovered to its full capacity. Uh, so particularly for that space, I mean, what kind of opportunities do you see? And after very long bear market, how are you so confident that there will be growth returning in the two-wheeler space? Absolutely. So you will again have to think about the context as we already kind of discussed that yeah. there were issues in terms of an income hit, which had an impact on the demand. Now let's divide India into three buckets. You look at the top 25 to 30 percent of India today, they have better income versus pre-COVID. They're all doing well, right? They're purchasing more, they're doing more discretionary purchase. Look at the next 40%, beyond that 30%. The middle 40% is what is struggling or was struggling till about a year back. 
they their income is still below pre covid mm. but things are gradually reviving for this particular 40% they have mm. still it's still not back to pre covid numbers mm. right which is why you saw that hit to the entry level cars you saw that hit to that entry level two wheelers mm. and that this is the particular segment which is kind of slowly and steadily improving as we speak right so we'll have to think about where is the demand coming from at this point in time demand is coming from more premium cars more premium two wheelers you're seeing more uh, electric vehicles consumption at this point in time the bottom uh, part is where there's a hit which is going to revive over the next couple of years and this is going to be a gradual process so we aren't kind of uh, at this point in time making a hypothesis that this is going to be a very fast recovery mm. this is going to be a gradual recovery over the next couple of years but thankfully it seems to us but from a demand side as well as from the cost side things are hit a bottom and things can only gradually improve from here on okay there was a very interesting graph actually i just want to my director to pull it up once again uh, the number of cars per 1000 people in india Correct. right compared to what we see across the world Correct. so there are just 24 cars in india per 1000 people compared to say us having 340 cars and italy at 650 now these are this is not apples to apples comparison because Correct. the per capita gdp is very different for developed countries and for our own country you know we have issues like infrastructure issues road problems etc uh so i just want to talk about is that a very simplistic argument that we are on a structural uptrend only because the uh, the penetration is so low and what kind of sustainable growth do you see sure sonia you will have to think about you know there's a lot of noise in the equity markets there's a lot of global volatility and we all get bogged down by near term stuff mm. but think about india india has a 3 and a half trillion ballpark 3 and a half trillion dollar economy we'll move to a 10 trillion dollar economy in the next 12 to 15 years right we can debate it'll happen in 12 years you will tell me 15 years somebody will tell me a uh, different time frame so if that happens the per capita income on average for a large part of the population will start inching up to closer to 2000 and higher it's already happened in certain parts of india in certain uh, certain states like maharashtra gujarat karnataka where you're seeing that the overall consumption is far higher once it happens across india that is where you will start seeing this entire penetration which you spoke about in terms of the per uh, person overall consumption at this point in time is far far lower both in terms of two wheeler as well as passenger vehicle this will start kind of inching up so this is a big opportunity we as a country are going to move up to a much higher number uh, per capita income will move up and finally with that should start reflecting in volume whether it's the entry level car or whether it's some of the premium cars okay and we all know the listed players right here there's mnm there's maruti there is uh, tata motors of course but auto ancillaries i want to talk about that it's a very wide scope over there right uh, because there are maybe 100 auto ancillaries in a car right auto parts rather right. tell us where all do the opportunities lie it's it's there all across our companies when you look at our entrepreneurs and the the kind of uh, work that they are doing at this point in time a uh, phenomenal work uh, our entrepreneurs are doing just to kind of you uh, showed this particular graph over here say for example the alloy wheels mm. which is a part where 100% was imported till a couple of years back mm. today 70% is done in india and next two years 100% will be done in india mm. so from a, this is a import substitution play mm. right and this has been done by our entrepreneurs who are identifying areas which can be done in india at the lowest cost you have opportunities in new areas like a adas sensors mm. uh, bms so there's a whole host of opportunity which is coming up in the entire auto ancillary space so you want to talk about the companies of course these are not of course by recommendations but right. which are the companies that are doing parking sensors door switch panels alloy wheels that you spoke about the leading I, players there sure so i'll give you a couple of examples and without naming companies but to give you a a rough idea of where how things are shaping up you think about the one of the largest fasteners company in india right now they there's this pli incentive that has come up with that they are doing a 350 crore capex for the export market so they are not only gaining with higher proportion of overall volumes coming from the domestic market and they getting into newer product lines then they are also trying to do capex uh, with all these incentives for the export market similarly when you think about uh, uh one of the largest bearing companies in india mm. it has identified a couple of uh, key components again with this pli incentive it makes sense to manufacture in india not only for the indian market but for the export market mm. you have one of the largest well diversified auto ancillary player uh, so like minda industries for example for right? example I minda mean, industries every part of the car i think there's like 80% of the car that minda supplies and to and you look at look at how they have kind of uh, overall look at their journey over the last 5 yeah. to 10 years the they identified the components which component should 
work in India? What is the volume at this point in time? How will this shape over the next couple of years? Can we indigenize? Can we make this in India? And finally, the right kind of partnership. Mm. So this is this is a very structural trend, which is not only going to help the auto ancillary companies capture the domestic market in a much higher way, and there are good companies doing that, but significant part of the export market because this entire China plus one and Euro plus one theme is for real. This is going to take time. People talk about near term numbers and say there's going to be volatility and things won't play out. But this is a far more, more structural trend which will play out over the next couple of years. Also electric vehicles, right? I mean, uh, FADA put out the data this week where they spoke about a 200% rise overall in industry and over 150% in passenger vehicles, etc. Um, we've saw, seen a new launch from Hero in the electric vehicle right. space. So within that bracket, which are the companies in the auto ancillary space that could uh, dominate? So again, you look at auto ancillary, we'll divide it between two-wheeler companies and the four-wheeler companies. You look at two-wheelers, there are about uh, 18 to 20 companies, new companies which are trying to penetrate this particular market. Nonetheless, you look at the incumbents, they are all working hard to ensure that they're on the right side of disruption. They're trying to get the products which should ensure that they gain market share incrementally. Mm. Similarly, you look at the four-wheeler players. All, most four-wheeler four players have got credible products or are in the process of getting those credible products in the market. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, what we think is the listed incumbent players have a decent chance to ensure that they kind of retain the market share or in some cases gain. That said, there are certain companies that we have identified which are not on the right side of disruption, haven't invested so like much. which ones? Unfortunately, <laughs> we can't name that, but okay. it will get reflected in our portfolio soon. Uh, so, which should, which is where this entire active management will come into play. Okay. We'll try and kind of have significant underweights and name which we think are not on the right side of disruption, we'll lose out and vice versa, we'll have very high weights and names which we think are on the right side of disruption, will gain more market share, have the right model cycle or are the right auto ancillary company which are gaining share as one of the companies you mentioned. Okay, well let's do one thing, there's also a logistics sector which is huge in its own way, so we'll slip into a short break, don't go anywhere, when we come back, more on smart money. We'll talk about the logistics sector and how you can invest there. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Smart Money on CNBC TV 18. We're talking about the big opportunity in the auto, transportation and logistics sector. Before the break, we were speaking to Harish Bihani of ICICI Pro about the big trends in the auto sector. And now let's talk about logistics because a lot is being done by the government as well to push this sector. So tell us what are the key trends here? I think we'll have to kind of think about the big picture first over here in terms of what the government is trying to do. Government is trying to formalize our economy mm. with the implementation of GST and all the other changes that the government have done over the past many years now. And in that context, government came up with this policies on Gati Shakti or the national logistic policy. Government is trying to do is to ensure that the efficiency of the entire system improves. And with that, the logistic uh, companies or the logistic players or the overall logistic cost in our country at this point in time is in double digit as a percentage of GDP. Uh, this is leading to market share losses, especially global market share losses. So government is aiming that we should get this down to single digit closer to developed countries over the next five to 10 years. If that happens, what happens is that we'll start gaining market share mm -hmm. from global players. Our working capital level comes down. We become significantly efficient as a country, as some of the companies start gaining global market share. Mm -hmm. And this is the theme which is there. And in that context, as the overall uh, country formalizes, the companies formalizes, there is a market share gain in terms of unorganized to organized. And that is another theme which is playing out in many sectors as we speak. It's already mm. played out because of COVID. It's got uh, even faster. And that is a theme which is going to play out significantly over the next So you want to compare years. the Indian markets with other developed markets? I'm just trying to understand what is the kind of potential that you see here in India versus other, de over the other developed economies? If, if you look at, say, the other developed economies, logistic play a fairly critical role, mm. whether it's the port players, the rail network, the road network, etc. And these are in terms of the absolute sizes, they are, these are far bigger in terms of the absolute size, mm. right? And why does that happen? That happens because you look at uh, these formal companies, some of these organized companies, they keep gaining market share mm. from the unorganized players. 
So that is what has happened in developed markets, mm. which is going to play out in the domestic market too over a period in time. Uh, because the efficiency which a formal organized company will be able to get to over a period in time is going to be significant. Mm. So this is a trend which has played out in most developed markets. Big have become bigger in logistics space and that is going to happen in India too. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of players here, right? You spoke about delivery a while back, there's TCI Express and several of them have been gaining quite a bit of market share as well. Correct. Uh, tell us that, you know, what are the top companies here that you would look at? I mean, these are of course not recommendations, but where do you see the, the shift of uh, from the unorganized to organized? Who do you think could be the big beneficiaries of this? All across. You look at whether some of the largest port companies think about what the size five years back versus today and think about where some of those will be. Similarly, you look at some road logistic players, there was a lot of hurdles because unorganized used to be a significant part and there used to be a lot of tax leakages in the system, mm -hmm. which is getting plugged as we speak and that is going to even get plugged over a period in time. So some larger companies will keep gaining share. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you have the uh, rail operators. Again, there are credible companies in this particular space. So in each and every space, you have credible companies that have been gaining gradual market share and this trend should likely continue. Again, as we spoke in terms of the auto plays, there are companies which are investing, whether it's in people, process, technology, mm. etc. We have to identify those companies which are mm. reinvesting what they are gaining at this point in time to ensure that they are on the right side of disruption, they will gain market share over the next three, five, ten years to come. Okay, so you have a fund, right, uh, an NFO, there's the ICIC approved Transportation and Logistics Fund. Uh, you spoke about what your um, your entire uh, investment rationale is, but tell us a little bit more about this fund. What are the kind of stocks, if I'm an investor in this fund, what are the kind of stocks I would get exposure to? We'll get expo you will get exposure to the entire gamut of auto OEMs, mm. the best in the class, with right model cycle, right market share gain opportunity, right volume value uh, growth opportunity value will come from premiumization, mm -hmm. right? You will get opportunity in terms of margin expansion because commodity prices are coming off and most of these OEMs have passed on all the cost hikes to the consumers. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be a gradual play. Similarly, you will get the best of the auto ancillary companies. Mm -hmm. These are great entrepreneurs who have reinvested money to ensure that they get those higher component value as you spoke about in one of the examples. Mm. And again, in logistics, you will get the companies which are getting, which are formal already, but these are organized companies which will keep gaining market share and this is fairly big opportunity over the next 10 to 15 years. Okay, but you know the problem with thematic funds is that, I mean, they of course are back in vogue now because the market is sort right. of picking up. But generally for a long-term investor, you know, thematic funds tends to get a bit tricky because you don't know when that theme is going to sort of, its life cycle is going to play out. Uh, what would your argument be to that? No, no, absolutely. So one has to think about the context of where we are in the business cycle, mm. where we are in the growth cycle and the margin cycle. So when you think about these three uh, characteristics and then you think about the overall kind of changes that could happen, you would see that we are at, at closer to the bottom of the business cycle. Uh, the growth cycle and the margin cycle. Mm. So one should be worried when you are at the top of these particular cycles. We think that we are not there at this point in time. Uh, or you would get worried if our country is not growing, the income levels are not growing, and there's a large section of the society that will continue to struggle mm. beyond, say, the near term that we're already seeing at this point in time. But if you think that our country will get far more affluent and there'll be a section which will continue to buy more discretionary goods, then this is a theme which should play out on average in the long term, mm -hmm. right? So that is what our That's call the is. Rational. Okay, well, Harish, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us on Smart Money and all the best Thanks, uh, for your fun. Okay, that's Thanks, the big Sonia. space that we're looking at, right? The transportation, the logistics theme and what to expect over there. But time now for the financial tip of the week. This is our weekly column where we tell you how to be financially savvy. And today we're going to talk about three important details every public provident fund account holder should know. Now, on the taxation front, we know that if you are a people PPF account holder, then there's the magic of exempt, exempt, exempt. However, since the last year, there is a new rule in effect. It's an unknown fact that there will now be a TDS payment on partial withdrawal in excess of 20 lakhs if the person has not filed the income tax returns in the last three years. So your tax is not completely exempt. If you don't file income tax in the last three years, then you would have to pay partial TDS on your PPF amount. So that's something that you need to keep on your radar. Uh, the second is on the maturity date of the PPF, the Public Provident Fund. 
um, we all know that the public provident fund maturity date is uh, 15 years but here's a fact that not too many people know the maturity date is not calculated from the date of opening the account the 15 years is calculated from the end of the financial year in which the first deposit was made and finally a PPF account for minors uh, if you want to open a PPF account for minors you can but it can be opened by either parent so one account per child you cannot have two accounts on two different names and grandparents cannot open a PPF account for a minor. So these are just some financial tips we thought we could share with you every week. Helps you to become financially savvy. Well, with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Smart Money. Thanks a lot for watching.